Today is the day! The sound of silence is actually something I long for, desperately. I live on a main ambulance route and the sirens are so frequent to the point where if I need to set a 10 minute timer for something, I could just wait for the next siren. That's actually how I cook. Say it says 25 minutes, I'll say, oh, that's two and a bit sirens, and then I'll have to go and get it out of the oven. I definitely know a thing or two about being disturbed. So uh, this should be right up my street, like the ambulances are. I guess being in the ambulances is worse, to be fair. So I'm more familiar with the Simon and Garfunkel version, if I'm being completely honest, which to me is really stripped back and soft. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how someone else covers it because I've heard other covers and I always wind up going back to the Simon and Garfunkel version. So we'll just, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm super keen because you guys have been like absolutely hammering for this and react. I am very familiar with Disturbed. I am a big fan. So I am familiar with their lead singer, David's um, vocal tendencies. However, I have not heard this cover. So this is a first impression Reaction. So here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you should know. Ho, ho, ho. I'm in. Hello. Please welcome Disturbed. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my own friend. Talk with you again because a vision softly creeping left its scenes while I was sleeping. And the vision that was planted. Wow, he's going bass level, bass notes, and already. Lyrically, even if someone spoke this song to me, just said the words, just spoke the lyrics, just said them as they were, in any way, in any context, I would probably cry. This song is everything. One of the best, well-written songs of all time, and we can argue that, but I'm not gonna, because I think I'm right on that one. Summon and Garfunkel, was it 1964? I think he wrote it over a few months, 1964, 65, 63, 64, not sure. Oh gosh, okay, wait, I'm, I'm trying to compose myself. What a deep, lustrous, gorgeous voice. Mm, beautiful tone. Left it seeds while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still So very first initial impression is not at all what I expected. No, not at all. I love that this is really stripped down, really ethereal, very ambient. It's just him and the piano so far. Um, his stillness that he is holding is almost has an innocence to it. It has a a sense of purity to it, but it, it carries a contrast that feels like loss, that feels like despair. His voice just rings. Just that was planted in my brain Still remains Within the sound of silence a lot of restraint. He is actively constructing the space in his throat to mean that the voice has a slightly smaller quality to it. These are your vocal cords, stretching and slacking in here. A little flap, your little epiglottis that comes over when you do things such as swallow, will slightly close over the cords where they're doing their little flappy thing in here to mean that the sound is amplified in a small environment. Now, if I were to add twang down there, it would sound extremely small. That would be quite an undesirable tomba for me to choose. However, because his voice is so big and his vocal cords are so thick, everything is massive. So when he adds a little bit of twang on that, actually, what you get is this extremely balanced, bright sound. Creeping. That is very 
shrunk. He's keeping his embouchure so tight to minimise projection and to encourage this twang technique, which gives it this very bright piercing quality. <coughs> And this is why, fairy voice children, that vocal technique is not one size fits all. If you are blessed with, look, oh, actually, look at the size of his neck. The width of that neck, my God. There is a lot of tissue there just waiting to be flapped. That is an exciting prospect. Oh, silence. I couldn't get over his eyes. His connection with his lyric shows up in his eyes. It almost made me start crying, to be honest, because it's like he's seen things he can't unsee. And connecting that with the beautiful warmth and richness of his tone, it's creating a different atmosphere to what I would normally associate with this song, because obviously Sermon and Garfunkel, they sing quite high, there's quite a light timbre to their voices, and yet he's got this warmth richness it's almost like there's a grounded feeling I don't, I don't know how else to describe it it just gives me a different feeling to the original version and I can't decide which I like better I kind of think I'm leaning towards his version oh my god touch the sound of silence. I'm just gonna have to like pause attack now and again otherwise I'm just probably gonna cry and be a heap of a mess of emotional discourse Okay, so there's so much build up to the song that he's doing and I, I need to, I want to remember orchestrally as well with the other one. I think it was more about just a harmonisation so I'm going to see what happens with that part with his friend, um, I think Paul Simon wrote it, didn't he? Emotionally charged song. I don't know, with a song like this you either need to do something different or you need to, oh, I don't think anyone needs to copy it in any way at all when it's, when it's so poetically beautiful and you want to keep the the justice and the honesty in the integrity of the song. Stop talking. Verse two, verse two, really upped the ante with intensity. I just want to say he's got really pretty eyes. <laughs> oh, really, really beautiful presence. Really, really beautiful. Bit distortion in that. Oh, lovely. Do you hear how the vocal cords came apart there? Sound for that kind of breathy, more open quality, and then of oh, silence, that connection. He's controlling this twang technique, much like you would control the biting point in a car. Like when you put the clutch down to change gear, you just want to do it just enough, so you change gear, and then you release it perfectly to go faster. So, so that's what he's doing. He's adding it on certain notes that he needs to add it on so they don't get too big. But then as his vocal cords slack, and the notes descend, you can hear how he gently lifts the twang off and creates a much more open space in his throat for the sound to resonate. The split the night. Very clever. Also, I love this. It's fabulous. Is that permanent? Can I try one? Fool said I you do not know. It's building. Silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words and I'm a high teacher. Take my arms and I'm a high teacher. I love that. That is a tongue manipulation there. When you 
tense the tongue in that shape, it actually gives you access to overtones as well. You hear the other notes in there? Just by that tension in the tongue. And he's brought that into So you get kind of little overtone in that note, which is oh, a bit of a treat, isn't it? He also used a technique here, which I like to call the breath boost. The breath boost is when you start a syllable or a word with H, even though it doesn't have an H in it. My heart, my words that are my heart to you. This could potentially be tactical, because when you add the breath boost, it's a sudden flood of air from your diaphragm up through your vocal tract, and it encourages the calls to stay a little bit more separate and gives it a bit of a blast. Ha! Ha ha! Ha ha! Now, what this can encourage is distortion because types of distortions such as growling and fry screaming is when there's little excess air and the vocal cords are slightly separate to allow breath to come through. So by beginning to add excess breath through the vocal cords, he's encouraging the vocal cords to potentially stay a little bit more separate, ha ha, as opposed to ah, where the vocal cords are very closed. If I wanted to add distortion halfway through a song, I would definitely add a few H's in before to train my chords and prepare them to kiss one another goodbye for a second while I flap you. Oh! He's been consistently building and there's still like a minute and a half left of this video. He can leave me waiting. Treat him mean, keep him keen. Definitely keen. Oh my God, did I just say that? Uh, on top of this beautiful, rich tone that he's got going, he's just sitting perfectly onto his low notes. He's not reaching for them. Whenever you reach for a low note, that gives it an opportunity for it not to come together properly. It will not sound quite as clean or as rich as the way he's singing them because he's just landing on those low notes. The voice has the opportunity to resonate. It's in balance with everything else that he's making. And then when he starts to ascend in his registration, the vowel choices that he's making are simply beautiful. It's keeping everything perfectly in balance. I was not expecting this. And it, let's, let's just keep going. Let's split in the night And touch the sound of silence And in the naked light I saw Ten thousand people, maybe Talking without speaking People hearing without listening People writing songs And voices never shared And no one dared Disturb the sound of silence Said I, you do not know. Silence like a cancer grows. Hear my words and I.
gosh, that's beautiful. doing so much awesomeness right there. I just got to take it back for us to relive it a little bit. Now, there's always like four things that we're looking for, four big things that must be in balance in order for you to move the voice with that kind of intensity. Relaxation. Check. He seems very grounded and very in control of what he's doing. Airflow. Check. It's very intense, but it is steady and consistent, almost like he's bulldozing his airflow forward. Resonating spaces, check, check, triple check. He's got nose and mouth resonating spaces and he is managing what he's doing in overtones, meaning jaw and mouth and then nose, nose. And then the last is his varying degree of muscle fiber with what he's doing on his, on his vocal folds. This is showing such a beautiful uh, demonstration of the strength in his vocal cords, that he can do very pure tones that are very clean and almost have a classical nature to them. And then he can he can really glide into that more rock, that grittier, distorted rock vocal, which is him compressing those cords, um, recruiting tons of muscle fiber, but he can he can recruit it, giving it intensity, and then he can let off of it all with control. So let's go back and, and hear that again. Yeah. Now you had vibrato to it. Oh. oh, it's amazing. What an absolutely beautiful use of distortion. That was better than I expected. Oh. oh do you know what? That was fucking amazing. Let's just watch that little distortion bit again. And the people bowed and Definitely gonna watch this at least 50 more times. <laughs> there are many technical reasons to adore this performance. The distortion that he used was extremely well controlled, he maintained perfect pitches, and he moved in and out of slightly different intensities of distortion, sometimes taking away completely for certain notes and then adding it, insinuating that he has exceptional control over his vocal cords and that he's very experienced and proficient, etc. We know. But this was exceptional.
exceptional vocal artistry because of how he arranged where the distortion was going to come in. I was expecting distortion from the beginning, but I think I was expecting something a little bit more virtuosic. But what I got instead was a beautiful palette of vocal sounds. And the owner of this palette of vocal sounds happened to be a master craftsman and cherry picked which of his sounds was appropriate where. He knew best. He knew what I wanted more than me. This singer must be acutely aware of how to make his audience feel certain things at certain times.